Hello everyone. Welcome to today's live web broadcast, Advances in Perioperative Care, Promoting Good Animal Welfare and Good Science. I'm Brenda Kelly Kim of Lab Roots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by Lab Roots and sponsored by Kent Scientific. Kent Scientific is the world leader in non-invasive blood pressure measuring equipment for mice and rats. For more information, please visit www.kentscientific.com. We have a few important announcements before we begin. This webcast is designed to be interactive and we encourage you to ask questions during the event. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. We'll try to answer as many questions as we can. You can enlarge the slide window by clicking on the screen icon in the lower right hand corner of the slide window. If you have any technical problems viewing or hearing this presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of your presentation window, or alternately submit your question through the green Q&A button lower left. I would now like to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Paul Flecknell. Dr. Flecknell is currently director of the Comparative Biology Center at the University of Newcastle and is the Professor of Laboratory Animal Science at the Institute of Neuroscience. His main research interests are anesthesia and analgesia of all species of animals, and in particular, the development of methods of pain assessment. I will now turn it over to Dr. Flecknell for his presentation. Thank you for that in introduction. Um, hello, everybody. Um, it's really great to be participating in this event. And I suppose I should say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on where you're logging in from. The session uh, today is going to be split roughly in half. In the first section, I'm going to talk primarily about advances in interoperative care and how we might apply them. Um, including a brief discussion of some of the newer anesthetics we have available um, and in the second half talk about some of the really interesting developments in pain assessment that are almost ready for cage side use in our facilities. So the reason for wanting to talk about this is that these advances that we're getting in the whole of the uh, perioperative area will allow us not just to improve the quality of scientific data but naturally lead to improvements in animal welfare. So first of all let's talk about uh, new anesthetics although actually they're not so new. Uh, most of the agents uh, that I'm going to mention have been around for quite a while in one formulation or another uh, but what we're seeing is a change in availability between uh, different countries and continents, a change in formulation, and a slow move, I think, by the lab animal science community uh, to uh, take on board some of these newer agents rather than sticking with, with more traditional methods. So I'm going to talk about sevoflurane and isoflurane, about alfaxan and propofol, and dexmedetomidine and medetomidine and xylazine. I was fortunate enough to have a holiday um, in Florida, um, ending up with doing some work at the North American Veterinary Conference, and so I was able to see that Alfaxan has just been launched in North America, um, so we can talk about that and not be talking about something that you would have to import. First of all, though, let's just look at what's being used at present uh, in uh, lab animal units and this was a literature survey that was brought up to date by Robert Dorwood who is a vet student at uh, Nottingham who spent some time with us doing a literature review. Uh, Robert looked at the reported anaesthetic use in papers that involved surgical procedures in rats and mice and as you can see over the two time periods uh, between 2005-06 and 2012-13, there's some changes. Uh, there are changes that we might expect, like uh, pentobarbital uh, has dropped in popularity because, of course, it's uh, no longer easily available as an anesthetic preparation. But we still see 
uh, extensive use of ketamine xylazine, older agents like chloral hydrate and tribromoethanol. I should add all of which have their place in certain uh, research settings but we're dominated by um, ketamine cocktails um, plus barbiturates and no sign of some of these newer agents. I don't think dexmedetomidine was mentioned once. I think we had one paper with ketamine metatomidine. I should add that I'm not ignoring the inhalants, but the injectable anesthetics make, made up over 70% of all anesthetics given to small rodents. So why so conservative? Because we, we do have other agents available. And this was my quick uh, and um, very brief survey using a simple Google Scholar uh, uh, citation search, looking at the individual anesthetics, all the ones that uh, I could come up with, and I did include their alternative uh, names, so avertin went in as avertin and as tribromoethanol, and I looked for any of these agents together with rat or mouse or rats or mice, and then expressed this as a percent of the citations. And you can see that um, early on, uh, we had ether dominating, uh, but then as anaesthetic ether um, became unavailable, uh, and as we realized the disadvantages of this agent, uh, it slipped from use. Uh, we had pentobarbital um, used consistently throughout the 70s, 80s, 90s, and uh, the 2000s. Uh, that we're going to see subside again because of, uh, of lack of availability in many countries of an anaesthetic formulation. And we see the rise of uh, ketamine steadily um, and to a lesser extent um, early on, but gaining ground isoflurane. What we don't see is a great deal of use of uh, desflurane or sevoflurane um, or propofol or alfaxan. Uh, all of the lines that hover around along the bottom, around the 0 to 5% mark, tend to be papers that for the newer agents that are actually describing the interaction of that agent with particular body systems with an interest for example in neuroprotective effects of some agents and so forth. So I think it's fair to say based on both those analyses that we're a fairly conservative uh, group and of course there are good reasons for that. The uh, newer agents Although we have good data on them, we have less track record using them in a research animal setting. Uh, and many research workers will say, if you say, how about switching to sevoflurane and giving it a try compared to isoflurane? I've used isoflurane for 10 years. It works well. I don't really want to change. So why might you? Well, uh, certainly from our, our experiences of mask induction of many species, and indeed, the literature reports of mask induction of children and adults with sevoflurane as compared to isoflurane, um, we see. Um, oh, okay. Um, I'm just checking on a question. Um, uh, before we leave those injectables, someone was asking about why is there a resurgence in the use of, of chloral hydrate? And I think probably um, with a sample of only 100 publications, it is susceptible to a few papers popping up from particular journals. And uh, chloral hydrate is still very popular with uh, neuropharmacological studies uh, because of its um, rather unique mode of action of not interacting with uh, many specific uh, uh, neurotransmitters in um, uh, as great a way as perhaps ketamine does, for example, with NMDA receptors. Uh, so I think chloral hydrate and indeed chlorolose are going to be with us uh, for so long as uh, particular groups of research workers see a specific advantage to the pharmacology of that anaesthetic. So back to um, sevoflurane, it's less pungent, it's better tolerated, uh, the induction times are faster, quite markedly so, the recovery times also ought to be faster, but in our experience, what tends to happen is animals pass into a state of sleep if you don't disturb them, and then when they do recover, the recovery is very much smoother than with isoflurane or indeed with halothane. 
Isofluorine, of course, has the advantage that it undergoes virtually no biotransformation and it's all exhaled. Uh, Sebofluorine does have a little uh, 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 proportion of the, of the drug metabolized rather than exhaled, uh, but not um, to any significant extent. But once again, it's a factor you'd take into uh, account. It is still significantly more expensive, even though I believe it's um, now available as a generic or certainly from several manufacturers rather than the original patent holder. The other drawback is that you need an agent-specific calibrated vaporizer. It's a highly potent anesthetic, so you can't simply drop it on cotton wool and put it into a, an anesthetic chamber. At least you can't if you want to use it safely. You need a vaporizer uh, like this one, for example, which is for sevoflurane. If you put it in a, a, a halothane or an isoflurane vaporizer, you certainly won't get uh, what it says on the dial. The alternative is to buy uh, a multi-agent system uh, like this one. Um, not only does this have the advantage of allowing you to put either isoflurane or sevoflurane in the syringe which is used to deliver the anesthetic, um, but it's designed for low flows for rodents. So this device is a syringe driver uh, that injects uh, anesthetic down into a heated block where the vapor is mixed with uh, anesthetic gases and then delivered uh, to the animal. And with that system, you can use um, both isoflurane and uh, sevoflurane. Um, someone's asked if I'll make the slides available. Uh, yes, I believe uh, uh, that's, uh, that, will be, that will be happening. Uh, so it costs more, um, but then let's just take a step back and think, why does it cost more? For those of you working with large species, yes, it will cost more, um, but moving to uh, closed circuit anesthesia, with fresh gas flows of 1 to 200 mils a minute and a, a circuit breathing system, you can reduce those costs significantly. For those of you working with rodents, I will lay odds that many of you who work with um, mouse particularly will be using fresh gas flows from your anaesthetic machine of 1 litre a minute or greater. And one of the reasons that you'll be doing that is that you've been told that because of health and safety you should be quite correctly be removing waste anesthetic gases and you may be using a system like this one and this has an inner uh, mass that delivers the anesthetic and an outer one that removes the waste anesthetic gas so you don't breathe it only the mouse does it's great it works well but if you drop the flows down as some of you may have experienced um, the Gas is entrained from the inner mask and the animals will wake up, which is um, not something you want to happen. If, however, you use a low flow system, then you can use much more appropriate flows. I've been extremely generous in the calculations here. I was redoing them while sitting waiting. And actually, minute volumes of mice is uh, less than 15 mils for the average mouse. You take um, the volume of one breath multiply it by the respiratory rate and you get the minute volume to stop the animal breathing back in the gas it's breathed out and inhaling carbon dioxide when it's on a face mask you need about three times that volume so we could use uh, fresh gas flows of uh, actually as little as about 30 mils never mind 45 mils with a 30 gram mouse and the calculation for the rat depends on the size of your rat but for mouse, the potential fresh gas savings are enormous. And of course, it's not just the gas, it's the anesthetic vapor that it contains. So low flow systems, um, this system uh, is all uh, appropriate low flows uh, with a, a small low dead space mask. Um, you can also buy passive scavenged masks from a variety of vendors uh, where the flows are so low and the seal around the mask um, is good around the mass uh, around the mouse's nose so the gas disappears away from you uh, but I, I will also almost guarantee that if you're working with mice and you use flows of less than 50 mils a minute you will find that 
uh, the natural ventil room ventilation and the fact that the gases are heavier than air will keep them well away from you uh, if you're doing surgery on the mouse. Uh, the only caveat I should add to that is that some of the vaporizers that you may have may not perform accurately at these very low flows. And indeed, the flow meter on your anesthetic machine may only go down to 100 mils. Uh, so you may need to invest in, in a, a flow meter and a vaporizer that will run at those flows in order to make these savings. However, it's worth thinking about if you're wanting to use some of these newer agents. And it's worth thinking about even if you're sticking with isoflurane. So moving on to alfaxan and propofol, the reason I mention this is that many of you are not going to rush to do total intravenous anesthesia in rats and mice. Those of you who work with larger species like pigs, um, like sheep, uh, dog, cat, um, and, and rabbit uh, will perhaps be using propofol already and will have perhaps tried alfaxan. Those of you uh, in Europe may well have tried alfaxan in its previous incarnation as a mix of two steroid anesthetics, alfaxalone and alfadalone. Alfaxan is uh, alfaxan um, formulated with some clever molecular um, uh, trickery so that it becomes water soluble and it's been relaunched in Europe and it's uh, I think an Australian company um, who developed it and started marketing it and it's now available in the USA. I'm sorry I'm not sure about Canada. So should I switch from propofol? Well um, there are all sorts of, of considerations. In terms of quality of anesthesia the two drugs are actually very similar. Um, they're both relatively non-cumulative. You can keep giving top-ups without unduly prolonging recovery times. You can give them both by continuous infusion. They have rather different pharmacologies um, and different solubilizing agents. Uh, propofol usually comes in intralipid, uh, a fat emulsion, uh, but there is also a, a, a non-lipid formulation available. So what it comes down to is what do you need for your particular research protocol and what, uh, how could the pharmacology of these two different drugs, propofol is a hindered phenol, alfaxan is a steroid uh, anesthetic. How could they interact with your protocol? Um, what particular features do you need for this anesthetic? But if I have a long anesthetic to do and I don't want to use an inhalant anesthetic or it's impracticable to do that, then I would think about um, popping an IV line in, which is easy in a rat, um, trickier in a mouse, but something you can do, uh, and running with one of these agents. So Moving on to the other group of agents I said I'd mention, uh, dexmedetomidine is the latest alpha-2 agonist that's become available in uh, North America and also in Europe. In Europe we also have metatomidine um, and of course all of us have had xylazine for decades. It's surprising to me that fewer people in a research setting have, have stuck with, uh, have switched from xylazine to um, metatomidine or dexmedetomidine. Okay, I was just getting a message to say you might have, have lost me, but it seems as though we're okay again. Dexmedetomidine is simply the dex isomer. Um, metatomidine is a, a mixture of 50 50 dexmedetomidine and levometatomidine. The levo f form uh, is not, uh, almost not active at all. So if you're translating um, dose rates for rodents that are ketamine metatomidine, or indeed for any other species, um, then you simply halve the dose in milligrams or micrograms. So if you're giving 0.1 milligrams of metatomidine, you'd give 0 0.05 milligrams of dexmedetomidine. They're both more specific alpha-2 agonists than xylazine. However, in practical terms, you will still see the same profile of side effects of vasoconstriction, of cardiac depression, and so forth. Which is why, if you're going to use these agents, 
you need also to buy the antagonist. And even if I can't persuade you to move from xylazine to the newer drugs, still buy the antagonist. Um, this re reverses virtually all of the uh, undesirable side effects of either xylazine or metatomidine or dexmedetomidine. One other thing to add, because we're often using these drugs together with ketamine, which is acidic and irritant, if we give it intramuscularly, uh, we can cause muscle damage and we can certainly cause pain. Many of us will give the drug IP and we know that that route of administration is not the best and is likely to lead to some failures. Uh, Wesley Burnside working in our lab compared subcutaneous dosing and found that uh, it's easy, it's quick uh, and the onset in mice is just as rapid as with the other routes. Uh, so it's certainly worth, worth trying if you've not used that route. In the rat, um, I'm more cautious and I like more data uh, because sometimes it's worked well and other times we've not been as, uh, we've not been as happy. So that's a brief run through some of the drugs that we might think about using. What I want to turn now to now is what they all have in common. Not just those drugs, but all the others that appeared on those graphs. And what they have in common is they all depress respiratory function, so they can cause hypercapnia and hypoxia and acidosis. They all depress thermoregulation and so can cause hypothermia. And they all depress the cardiovascular system to some extent or other. So we're trying to do carefully controlled uh, anesthetics in a reproducible way in ways that don't influence our animal models. So don't those effects matter? And shouldn't we know how cold our animals become or how, 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 how hypoxic or hypercapnic or hypotensive? We've got monitoring devices available that can help us answer that question even for small rodents. Now, for the last uh, couple of decades at least, we've had electronic devices uh, that we can attach to larger species um, to monitor them. And however enthusiastic I get during this seminar about these electronic devices, let's not forget that the single most important thing to have when you're giving an anaesthetic is clinical monitoring, to have a person watching the animal. But we have to face facts in a high pressure uh, environment in a research facility, our anaesthetic assistant is almost certainly having to help with other things. And they're only human, so they get distracted, they're asked to perform other tasks, or because they're only human, they actually can't measure the required parameter. So I can't tell you what a mouse's blood pressure is, or what its carbon dioxide in its expired gas is, or what its body temperature is, um, so I really need some electronic devices. I, should, I, I can't even tell you what a mouse's heart rate is uh, because I can't count fast enough. Um, this is a screen grab from our physio suite attached to a mouse and I think you can see we had a heart rate of 600 beats a minute. Does it matter that it's 600 beats? Well, what I'd like to know is if while I'm doing the procedure that heart rate drops to 500 to 400 to 300, by the time it gets to 200, I'll be able to count it. But I would like to know where it started and what it, how it's changing. And electronic devices can help me do that. So, as I said, those of you working with large species, there isn't a problem, the, I would say the sky's the limit, depends on your budget, but you can get a whole range of devices uh, that will help you uh, with anesthetic monitoring. With small rodents, our choices have been limited, but they're improving greatly. Once you get down below guinea pig in size, that's when you start to need to purchase some of the, the specialist apparatus. So let's look briefly at pulse oximetry. For those of you who are not familiar with it, what it's doing is measuring um, the percent saturation of the animal's haemoglobin, uh, which is a reflection of how well its tissues are going to be oxygenated if it, its circulation is good. It also looks at the wobble on the uh, pulse signal that it's, that it's looking at, and that gives you pulse rate. It needs to have its probe positioned over a nice, well-perfused capillary bed to work properly. So the probe size and positioning can be an issue. Um, you've got a couple of examples here of a clip probe um, on a mouse um, 
uh, using one instrument and a little circular probe that slides over the mouse's foot uh, uh, on the right here. In the past, the high heart rates and the low signal strengths were a real problem, but now we have instruments that can cope with that. And certainly if you want to get pulse oximetry in, in mice, um, this really isn't much of a problem now. And you can look at these different devices and see how well they suit your needs. Capnography still is a bit of a problem. So this is measuring the carbon dioxide in expired breath and also in inspired gas if you want to know that you've been using your anaesthetic circuits effectively. These devices either give you a number, which is the concentration of carbon dioxide at the end of expiration, or they give you a waveform showing you the pattern of expiration of CO2. They fall into two groups, either devices that sit in the airway and have the sensor right next to the animal, and these are mainstream uh, devices, or you have devices which have a little suction port on, uh, which sucks out uh, gas from the breathing system and analyzes it in the instrument. Both of them have problems with small animals. Um, the mainstream devices, even with pediatric attachments, introduce a significant dead space. And the side stream devices uh, sample at relatively high rates, relatively high for rats and mice. For larger species, you can use both equally well. Um, for the rat, you can get reasonable waveforms with both types of, of device. Uh, with mice, our experience is that even the specialist instruments don't give you accurate end titles, and it's because we're, we're really asking an awful lot of them. So I think that technology is not quite there. But pulse oximetry, no problems at all. So monitoring is great, um, and it tells you your, your mouse, perhaps, or your rat is hypoxic. And if it's hypoxic, you can perhaps presume it might also have high carbon dioxide. It's hypercapnic. So what do you do? Well, one of the obvious things you can do um, is intubate it. Uh, I've got a, a quick question which I'll take because we're on pulse oximetry, which is recommendations for pulse oximetry um, in uh, pigmented animals, um, in this case primates, but it applies um, to um, all species. Modern pulse oximeters can cope with that, and uh, we haven't uh, found a particular issue but what I always say to people and I'm sorry to any vendors listening um, I suggest that you ask for a trial and make sure that that instrument with that particular sensor works in your setting um, because there are quite a lot of variables in how you use the instrument and, and uh, how much it's being moved and so forth uh, but modern sensors really should cope with um, pigmented skin so what I was saying is what you do well the other it's not just Need, no, nice new electronic devices and new drugs. It's relatively simple kit um, that will help you do things that in the past were really quite difficult. Um, and that's one of these is endotracheal intubation. Um, and jumping the gun, Trish, you're asking, what do I recommend to intubate a rat with? Well, the kit here. Um, I actually buy, we actually have one of these tilting tables purchased from one vendor and this fiber optic system purchased from another. And you can, the tilting table is because I'm getting old and I don't like crouching down for long periods, looking down um, rats when they're placed horizontal on the table. So you lay your rat on the table, on the tilting table, and then it tilts up um, to form that angle. And you can look down, this is being very ambitious, you, you can look down um, from if I get this right, oh, it's refusing to do it now. From up here, from the top end of that arrow. So you're looking down into the larynx and getting the view in the middle. Um, let's get that right. So you get that view, um, which is looking down this axis um, at the animal with the table inclined. You thread your catheter onto the fiber optic uh, light source. We use an over-the-needle catheter. We use uh, for rats anything from a 16 gauge down to a 20 gauge depending on the size of rat 
and your level of expertise uh, and start with a slightly smaller catheter and then move on and for mice uh, we're using uh, 22, 24 uh, gauge catheters again um, look at uh, post-mortem as to what will fit easily and how you can use it there are other devices I should add and uh, a lot of this depends on how good you are at juggling dominant and non-dominant hand um, uh, to, to use these the tilting table is designed to be used with a, um, a modified otoscope speculum in fact I'll often use all three the fiber optic to give me nice illumination and guide my catheter the tilting table to get the animal at the, the right angle um, and um, the speculum to open the mouth uh, another question just popped up is are there any endotracheal tubes available with cuffs on the end not that I'm aware of for rodents and actually I'm not a fan of some of the very small cuff tubes that have been made for the exotic pets market because the dead space is, is large in the tube and you can't cut it to side. What we do, and I'm sorry I haven't put the slide in, is we, we slide a small piece of celastic tubing over the um, uh, endotracheal tube uh, about in a rat about half a centimetre or so back from the tip and when you tie the tube in place that silicon tubing pushes up against the larynx so right in there and acts as a seal right on the, the larynx and that prevents leaking. Um, if you've got uh, an appropriate ventilator you can compensate for small leaks in the system. For those of you, those of you who are thinking I'm just never going to do this but I would like to give oxygen and I can't use a face mask because it gets in the way of my surgery um, think about intranasal catheters. Um, <coughs> this guinea pig has a urinary catheter <coughs> excuse me, slid into its nares. Uh, this rat has an infant feeding tube. The external nares is the smallest diameter you can push the tube in. In the rat that's gone in about half a centimeter. We've lubricated it first and we can deliver anesthetic gases and we can adjust the flows and if we want to use volatile anesthetics the concentration to compensate for any breathing up the other nostril. Uh, it's easy, it works really well and it's a great solution um, if you don't have a purpose-made mask for your stereotaxic frame for delivering oxygen to animals in a, a stereotax. Finally I want to mention um, monitoring body temperature. All of these anesthetics depress uh, body uh, temperature regulation. We shave our animals for asepsis, we open body cavities, uh, we blow anesthetic gases sometimes at high flows, a litre a minute or so, um, and we also get evaporative losses when we, we open the abdomen, and we get evaporation from the respiratory tract. And then on top of that, for those of us working at the small end of, of the lab animal scale, um, we have very tiny animals with big surface areas relative to their body mass. Um, this graph plots surface area uh, relative to uh, body weight between mouse and blue whale and you can see there's a lovely linear relationship but this is a log log plot uh, and the relationship would actually be curvilinear if I, I plotted it linearly and what it would show you is that the mouse has a disproportionately high surface area relative to its body mass compared to the whale or species in between. The consequence of this, uh, we've got here some data from a wet lab we ran years ago where we had uh, five rats on different heating systems and our homeothermic system uh, worked well or reasonably well. Uh, the other systems worked not too badly. Um, our blue line, our non-homeothermic uh, heated pad, uh, didn't do too well initially and then caught up and that's because we didn't let it reach 38 degrees before we put the rat on it and had we done that we'd have been much more successful. If we did nothing we got down to 28 degrees. Now you may say but I'm never going to run a rat for four hours or five hours anaesthesia but that was a single dose of injectable anaesthetic and we'd slowed metabolism so much that the animal was not going to recover. So they're going to lose heat and we've got to keep them warm. And we've got to be sure that the methods we're using to keep them warm are working because if we don't, we'll get slow recoveries. 
we'll get immunosuppression and increased risk of post-op infection. And if we really have problems, we'll get cardiac arrest if we get very low temperatures. And don't forget, at small changes in temperature, uh, we're going to get massive changes uh, in uh, cell membrane kinetics, enzyme pathways, and so forth. So let's not rely on, on clinical monitoring. Let's have a thermometer that works. They're available from a range of vendors. You can get ones that come together with uh, a heating system um, that's uh, monitoring the mouse and the pad uh, and making sure there's no overheating as well as underheating. Uh, you can get standalone systems. For larger species, there are plenty available. But the key thing to do is check what the lowest temperature is because in some thermometers designed for clinical use, the assumption is you'll never be colder than 35 degrees. And trust me, with a small rodent, you can be. There are lots of, of heating systems. I'm not going to um, go into any details, but uh, just to make a plea for anyone who is keen on uh, uh, home electronics or any vendors out there, I would love a bear hugger, a forced air warming system that was scaled down to work with rodents uh, because they are so effective with larger species. It would just be great if we could have one for rats and mice. When we're going to wake the animal up, we're going to carry on with this monitoring until we're sure that all is well and the animal is uh, ready to go back to either a recovery area or to its home cage. And one of the key things that we're going to do is ensure good analgesia, which brings us on to the next uh, phase of this session, which is pain assessment. And where, where are we now? And I think where we are now is a situation where there is a huge increase in, in interest in providing analgesia for all species of animals um, and naturally then working out how to give them most effectively. This is a quick trawl through Google Scholar doing a citation analysis on post-operative pain alleviation, animals and veterinary. And what you see is that nothing much happened until this decade. And we'll do it again uh, in the near future, and I suspect that will have gone up even further. And what we're seeing is a huge increase in interest, and that being translated into greater analgesic use. But that increase in analgesic use um, is rather slow coming. I'll bring this right up to date at the end of the session, but this is Claire Richardson and uh, uh, Emma's data uh, from these, public, these publications. Um, this again is um, analysis of the literature looking at reported analgesic use, although with the, um, uh, the Richardson and Flecknell study, uh, we also did an email follow-up to ask about reporting. Uh, and what we found was that analgesic reporting was very low in the 90s, but had come up to 20% of all publications involving uh, surgery in rats and mice in 2005 to 2006. But that's still a relatively low use. As I say, I'll come back to it and we'll talk about why, or some reasons why. So, of course, looking at that low pattern of use, you can say, well, surgery causes pain in people, the neurophysiology is the same, let's give animals the benefit of the doubt and give them analgesics. And that's what I always used to say. And that was largely supported if you gave appropriate doses of analgesics for relatively short periods. But if you start to give big doses of uh, drugs like meloxicam, and I'm not singling out metacam, any non-steroidal could do this, you can end up with GI toxicity. But one or two doses uh, immediately around the time of surgery are very rarely going to cause problems like that. But prolonged usage is difficult, which may, can, be, can be difficult and can cause side effects. So what we need to think about is how much and for how long? And that's a difficult question. Much of our data on analgesic efficacy and safety comes from uh, basic pain research. And here's one example of giving morphine to all of these different inbred strains and looking at efficacy on a hot plate test. And we have strains here where the effective dose 50 is less than 5 milligrams per kilo and strains here where it's 20 to 25 mg per kilo. Now, the dose needed for controlling post-surgical pain may be much less 
or maybe different. Um, and we need to know uh, what dose is appropriate for our strain of mouse or our strain of rat in our facility having undergone the particular surgical procedure. We need to know when we've chosen a drug and given it, if it's worked, when we should repeat the dosing, and when we can stop treating. Now these are pretty fundamental questions, and yet we've been dodging them in our research activities for many, many years. We've assumed that you know, the best we can do is give some analgesics and almost hope for the best. Well, I think we can move on now, because where we were was we were using clinical impression, or to be more honest, um, our intuition, because we work with lab animals, whether we're investigators or veterinarians or vet techs, we just know. Well, the sad fact is we don't just know. We can pick up, I think, extremes of problems related to pain or distress, but how often do we see that? Most of the time we're dealing, I think, with mild to moderate pain. We took on board uh, what our colleagues were doing uh, with uh, medical clinical practice, um, and we started using numerical rating systems and visual analog scoring. Then we got colleagues in veterinary clinical practice coming up with much more rigorously constructed pain scales, uh, like the Glasgow pain scale for use in dogs. And we also looked at some objective measures. Um, but many of these either required a lab, for example, looking at corticosterone responses, or were retrospective. Where we are now is that many of us um, have looked at our animals, have assessed their normal behavior, have looked for, for behaviors that either increase or decrease in frequency after surgery, have picked up on abnormal behaviors, and started to select behaviors that we think we can use for cage side pain scoring. And for some species and for some surgeries, we've got very good data to, uh, to back that up. So back in uh, 2000, uh, Johnny Rowan developed pain scoring systems for rats that could be applied after laparotomy. Uh, and there are other publications to support Johnny's findings. And he's gone on to publish a whole string of, of papers validating that approach. But those behaviors, and this is the illustration from this early paper on rats with renal calculi, uh, only occur with laparotomy. And of course, we want to look at thoracotomies and jugular cannulations and craniotomies and so forth. We have similar data in the mouse, and we're gaining data in rabbit and in guinea pig. And this is some pre-publication data from Yvette Ellen, um, who uh, did uh, a Doctor of Veterinary Medicine thesis with, with us. Um, these are guinea pigs uh, post-orchidectomy, uh, a group who received what we would consider inadequate analgesia, and a group receiving a local anesthetic plus meloxicam. And this is the count of abnormal behaviors uh, observed by video monitoring these animals. So Yvette will be reporting this in full, but I put it up to show that even with a species that we think freezes when you look at it, you can come up with a pain score system. But I would add she did this by using remote video monitoring. So we can use behaviors, but we can also use another behavior, and that's pulling a face. And for a long time, nobody really picked up on this until Jeff Mogul's lab published in 2010 showing that mice have pain faces. And we know that babies have pain faces and children have pain faces. And the internet will show us that dogs and cats have pain faces. But what about other species? And can we use it to score pain? Well, here's some data from, again, from one of Yvette's studies. Uh, two mice, uh, both undergone vasectomy, both received analgesics. Uh, the mouse on the left just looking at pain faces, I would say um, he's doing OK. Um, I still might want to look at him again and uh, check that he doesn't need more analgesics. But the one on the right, on my right anyway, is showing orbital tightening, um, has got some cheek bulging, some nose bulging, uh, and I think needs a top up with either more carprofen or a different analgesic. So to answer the question, do animals have pain faces? Yes, they do. Can we use them for cage side assessment yet? We can start, but what we have to do is go into this with our, our eyes wide open. 
we're going to see a string of publications over the next year or so dealing with pain faces in macaques, in dogs, in cats, in horses, in pigs and sheep, perhaps even in fish, um, and in mouse, rat and rabbit. But what we know in certainly these species is that there are numerous other factors that can affect facial expression, that sedation can be a major confound, and infuriatingly there are different expressions of degree of, of grimacing in different mouse strains. So I don't think it's going to prove to be the gold standard for assessing pain, but I do think it's going to be a really useful technique. I want to illustrate what I mean about the confounding factors again, uh, thanks to Yvette with some data from her thesis. Um, these are three strains of mice, bulb C's, C3HE's and C57 black sixes. On the left we've got a group who've had vasectomy surgeries. On the right, mice who've just had an anaesthetic. And what we can see is that our bulb C's are both pulling what look like pain faces. Our C3HE's who've had surgery are pulling a pain face, but it's not so obvious uh, in our C3HE's who've just had an anaesthetic. And our bulb C's are doing pretty much nothing. So what you need to know, just as with pain behaviours, you need to know how your strain of mouse behaves normally, you need to do the same uh, with pain faces and look at some control mice and see what's happening. And hopefully both Yvette uh, and Amy Miller, who's uh, uh, working in our lab, um, will publish to explain how you can approach this problem and how you can tackle it. Finally, I want to mention some really interesting new metrics that, again, might be translatable to cage side assessments. And these have come out of a dissatisfaction from the pain research community that the standard old measures of nociceptive testing of hot plate and tail flick and so forth weren't proving particularly successful uh, in developing new drugs, particularly for chronic and neuropathic pain. And there have been moves in assessing these types of pain in people to move away from pain questionnaires and visual analogue scores to developing sort of quality of life scoring of looking at how well people function. Did they get up? Were they motivated to get up, to go out, to socialise, to get dressed, to wash, to keep house and so forth? And are there parallels in rodents? And could that be building a nest, socialising with your cage mates, maintaining a burrow, and performing other highly motivated behaviours. And I think the, probably the first step uh, in developing this was the uh, use of burrowing behaviour, which was proposed as a measure of general uh, well-being in rodents. And the initial paper showed that it was influenced by viral and bacterial infections and by CNS lesions. And then it was demonstrated uh, in 2011 that rats with peripheral nerve injury, with neuropathic pain, and with inflammatory pain, reduced their digging behaviour. And this was digging um, uh, gravel out of a, a test bowl. And that if you gave analgesics, you could reverse that and normalise the digging. And just recently we have another publication uh, looking at this in joint pain, and I'm sure more will follow. Uh, we also have data in mouse um, um, from Pauline Jerkoff in Switzerland um, and sorry I was trying to pick up a question and it's disappeared but I'll pick it up later um, and a quick apology uh, that I spelled her name correctly here but not on the next slide uh, she's looked at latency to burrow as well as um, uh, weight of pellets um, uh, post-surgery and in other circumstances in mouse and this is some of her data from this paper um, uh, spelt with one F, not two, if you want to go and download it. Uh, this is latency to burrow in hours in mice who've either had surgery, uh, surgery plus pain relief, or the an appropriate anaesthetic controls. And what you see in, uh, compared to baseline, which is an orange, is that all of these procedures decrease, um, the, uh, sort of increase the time taken to burrow. Uh, but giving analgesics um, to mice who've had surgery reduces that latency significantly. 
Um, I urge you to read the full paper and the other publications from this group, which develop this whole idea uh, very clearly. And what I would say is that all you need is a bottle and some pellets of diet uh, to try this out. And once again, you need to know, does my strain of mouse burrow? How quickly does it burrow? And can I use this as a quick test of its, perhaps we should say its well-being? Uh, the group in Switzerland have also looked at nest building, as have some other groups. And once again, like other measures, nest building is affected by other factors. And at the moment, what we'd say is that if we see a mouse that was building a well-formed nest and it no longer does that, um, then it needs your attention. And it could be pain or it could be something else. What do I propose about the post resected mice? Um, again, I'll come back to that later. I'm trying to pick up questions as we go, because um, I know some of you will dash off to other sessions, um, uh, but I'll, I'll try and catch up uh, with all of these shortly. So nest building, if we're providing nestlets as environmental enrichment, uh, and we're looking at our mice, uh, then we can apply some of those assessments. Uh, perhaps burrowing is something we can incorporate as a, as a measure and we need to know what other factors affect it, how it varies between strains and what's the best way of doing this assessment. But I'm really optimistic. I think we've already overcome major misconceptions about the nature of pain in animals, the responses to pain in animals, uh, what analgesics we can use and the relative importance of their side effects. And how about the progress we've made, the real progress in terms of how many rats and mice, and I'm focusing on rodents because they're the species we know from these literature reviews are least likely to get analgesics. Um, how well are we doing with them? And this again is Robert's data, which I hope he's going to publish uh, shortly. Uh, he repeated the 2005 6 uh, literature analysis and added in 2012 to 13 using the same uh, 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 literature review strategy for selecting the papers. And we've improved over those that time course, but we still only have 22% of those of those publications specifically saying they gave an analgesic post-surgery. We have another 27% in which the analgesic that was used, um, sorry, the anesthetic that was used had an analgesic component. But we're getting nearly half those animals not receiving anything. Now, why is that? Well, I think one of the key issues is not that people don't care or they don't think about the issue, but they are concerned that if they give an analgesic, it can interact with their research protocol and confound their research data. And since the only reason we've justified using animals for this purpose um, is to get good data, uh, that would indeed be a, a big problem. But I don't think it's an insurmountable problem. Our pol policy here at Newcastle is always to give at least one dose of analgesic, to give it preemptively so we have the analgesic working before the animal recovers, if it's possible, to use multimodal analgesic protocols if we can, and particularly if the surgery allows to incorporate local anaesthetic regimes, and then to try and use a method of pain assessment and adjust the analgesic. And when we get to the issue of a research worker who says, I'm concerned because I've seen that buprenorphine has immunosuppressive effects, so I don't want to use it. You take out the publication, you say, yeah, it does, but look at the dose they had to give to produce that effect. Um, it's 10 or 20 fold higher than the dose we're proposing to use for post-surgical analgesia. And if that's still a problem, well, how about we use non-steroidals? And if that's still a problem, what about local anaesthetics? And I think there is always a potential solution. We shouldn't have animals uh, not receiving anything. So I'm happy to take some questions. I want to close by thanking uh, the various people who funded um, the individuals working at Newcastle on these uh, issues who are part of our Pain and Animal Welfare Science Group. I also want to thank particularly uh, those bodies who have supported our education activities and to highlight the National Centre for the Three R's who've just funded um, production of some interactive learning resources 
and with a bit of luck we'll get the URL popped up for you. The first one has just been launched which is Introductory Anesthesia. It's free to use via the NC3R's website and a, syst and a, uh, a second website that we run will allow tracking of individual users and we uh, would love to have your feedback on it uh, to see how it's working and we're hard at work on the next stage of anesthesia, more complex anesthetic procedures and analgesia and pain assessment uh, and so forth. And we hope over the next year or so uh, to make those available to you. So thank you very much for listening um, and I'm happy to, to take some questions. Um, a second website that we run Thank you, Paul, for that informative presentation. Before we get started on the question and answer session, I would like to remind our audience how to submit questions. You can submit questions by typing them in the Q&A box, which can be found clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. And we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Our first question, our lab conducts mechanical ventilations on laboratory rats. To make sure they are adequately ventilated, we use a blood gas analyzer. Do you believe that pulse oximeter technology has progressed for use in the rat to the point where it would be almost as accurate as our current method? Um, if you're ventilating your rats with um, room air, then you will get a reasonable estimate of how well you're ventilating but um, it won't be as accurate as blood gases. If you're ventilating with uh, inspired oxygens of 30-40% uh, or more, which is what would be normal practice, um, then you won't get any indication because the, unless you have terrible ventilation, the pulse oximeter is going to uh, give you high saturations. If your endotracheal tube's gone down one bronchus and you're only ventilating one lung, then the pulse oximeter will pick that up. But what you really need as an alternative to blood gases uh, is capnography. And one approach that we've used successfully in the rat, because the, di the difficulty with uh, even the newer blood gas uh, analyzers is the sample volume is relatively high, at least for frequent sampling. We use um, a cap capnograph uh, we measure the entidal carbon dioxide and we take a blood gas and we adjust our ventilation if necessary take another one um, and we can then follow the trend on our capnograph and if that stays stable that has proved to be a good reflection of what's happening to uh, arterial PCO2 uh, and that avoids the need to take multiple blood gases right the way through and then at the very end you can take a last one to reassure yourself that all worked well. Uh, so I'm afraid pulse oximetry, no. Uh, there is a capnograph that's marketed for rodents that will give you a really nice accurate waveform, uh, but it is very, very temperamental in our hands, and we've tried three versions of the, of the instrument. Email me offline and I'll, I'll give you more details, but um, I think the approach that you've got of blood gas analysis and uh, maybe incorporating a capnograph would, uh, uh, would help. Now, I just need to remember to pass back to Brenda, who can get the, whoops, who can get the, sorry, Brenda, I, I pressed the wrong button. And I seem to have really messed up here. Um, no worries, Paul. Here I am. Uh, we have another question regarding pain scoring. Why not evaluate muscle contraction or body movements? So the question is to um, evaluate muscle contractions and body movements. So during anesthesia, of course, we use these reflex responses um, routinely. Um, when we're doing our clinical observations of animals, we look at body posture and we look at uh, activity. And certainly if, for example, you've got a painful limb, then the animal's favoring it and it's pretty obvious that there is an issue there. Differenti differentiating between mechanical impairment of a limb and pain causing reluctance to use a limb can be difficult. And rather disappointingly, um, 
work from ourselves and others looking at uh, overall activity levels um, have not been particularly successful. Um, when you do more sophisticated analyses, uh, for example looking at circadian rhythms, that's much more helpful, but I suspect that many of those analyses are actually looking at more than just pain. Um, and I say that because often analgesics do not normalize those changes rapidly, um, and yet uh, to all intents and purposes the animals appear pain free. Uh, so my hopes at the moment are a combination of some altered highly motivated behaviors, some abnormal behaviors, and pain faces as a way of coming up with some composite scoring, not neglecting simple things like weighing the animal and looking at its food and water consumption. Thank you, Paul. Just as an aside, so the audience knows, PDF of Dr. Flecknell's slides will be available in the Resource Center here immediately after the session is over. You can leave the presentation, log back in, and they'll be available. Our next question is, what kind of bedding material would you recommend for housing lab animals after surgery? So we use a product um, that was originally called vet bed. Um, it's also called dry bed. Um, it's uh, a synthetic sheepskin, a, a synthetic fleece, I think would be my North American translation. Um, it's autoclavable, machine washable, uh, urine drops through it. It's great for big animals and it's great for small animals. Um, rats and mice will chew it, but they take a long time to destroy it. And we haven't had problems with um, large numbers of fibers being ingested. Um, and we use that a lot. Um, any of you who've, who've picked up on, on uh, uh, images that we've produced, we often have an animal sitting on, on dry bed. Um, there are alternatives, but what, what I would say to avoid are sawdust and any material that's going to stick to the animal's uh, nose, mouth, uh, anus, um, because that's going to um, uh, make it feel uncomfortable, it's going to need to be groomed off. Um, and of course, if it gets rubbed into its eyes, that can be a real problem. So I prefer that tissues I find pretty unsuccessful because the animal, the first thing it seems to do is push them out of the way. Um, I'm sure maybe someone else has got some, uh, some other materials that they really like, but it needs to be absorbent, it needs to be non-irritant, and it needs to avoid going into the animal's eyes and mouth. Thank you, Paul. We have another question. Is anybody working on biochemical markers of pain in animals so that a simple blood test can be developed for pain assessment other than steroids? I'm sure there's a great deal of activity in the pain research community to look for biomarkers of pain. And there are um, molecular markers of particular types of pain that are being developed. But what we're interested in, I think, is, is something we can use, if not cage side, but quickly and easily. What you might be able to, to, uh, to do is say, OK, I'm doing the same surgery, the same strain of animal for the next year, same surgeon. Um, uh, let's uh, assess the first few animals using our hypothetical biomarker, show that our analgesic regime is working, and away we go. The problem with that is that we know from experience in people that the efficacy of analgesics and the degree of pain varies tremendously from person to person. Uh, and even if they've undergone the same surgery with the same surgeon. And uh, there's a concept in uh, analgesic clinical trials called the number needed to treat which is the number of patients you need to give your drug to to get a 50% reduction in their pain. And the number you need to give, for example, oral tramadol to ranges from four to six, depending on the clinical trial. So what that means is that when we give our standard drug to our standard mouse after its standard surgery, there is the likelihood that some of those mice uh, will need some additional uh, analgesics. And the only way we are going to be able to do that in a way that will benefit those particular mice is by assessing their pain cage side and intervening and giving more drug. So that's why I'm keen on these, these real-time pain assessments. And I do appreciate the logistics 
um, uh, of that and the difficulties that can that can produce um, in a research busy research environment. Thanks, Paul. Our next question: Do you still encourage oral administration of buprenorphine? We have a model of hemophilia in rodents and tried buprenorphine SR to limit injections, but the resulting hematoma can induce more bleeding. We'd like to try one injection of that and then PO buprenorphine, but are getting pushback. What is your answer? What is your opinion? So the um, giving buprenorphine orally, there are now three or four about five or six publications describing different approaches to doing that in drinking water, in drinking water plus supplement, uh, in uh, materials like Nutello and so forth. Uh, one of the problems uh, is that uh, sometimes it's not going to work and there are some publications from the US showing that even at high doses uh, quite clearly in, in some rats you don't get good analgesic efficacy. One of my pharmacology colleagues um, suggests that this is because the um, first pass extraction of, of or rather the low bioavailability of buprenorphine when you give it by mouth um, which is uh, something like 90% to 95% uh, simply is, is, is not available um, uh, to have activity as an analgesic. Small changes in um, that fraction that's available can have big effects on the analgesic effect. So we've, we've used it ourselves. Um, it has attractions as with other oral formulations of being able to give the drug um, and uh, then leave the animal alone. Uh, it, can, it can dose itself if you've got the, the uh, food pellet in it's habituated to that. But you need to combine that with pain assessment. And so for that reason, I preferred giving injectable. Thank you, Paul. We have another question. Do you have any experience or advice using long-acting topical fentanyl in laboratory animals? That is worth looking at. And the final thing I'd say is assess whether you really need um, opioid level um, uh, of pain control after that subsequent injection. Uh, and is there something else you could use? Although I suspect um, if you're looking at um, the model you're using, you don't want non-steroidals that even temporal that even temp Thank you. I think we're having a, a technical issue. We'll have one more question. What is your thought on combining anesthetics in rodents, i.e. low-dose ketzaline subcutaneous with isoflurane? I think that's a really excellent idea and it's a really good approach. Um, one, I'm surprised um, someone didn't pop up and say, we've tried ketamine metatomidine in mice, it doesn't work. And there are, again, there are publications out there showing that in some strains of mice, you don't get full planes of surgical anesthesia. Now, when you've given your cocktail of drugs, either intraperitoneally or subcutaneously, giving a top-up dose can be a little bit hit and miss. And one of the simplest things you can do is give a very low concentration, that's all you'll need, of isoflurane. Um, so something like half a percent isoflurane uh, to supplement your injectable um, is going to uh, give you that deepening of anesthesia uh, that you might not otherwise get. You can also say, well, I do get full surgical planes of anesthesia um, with ketamine metatomidine, but I also get undesirable side effects let's drop the dose I'm using down to reduce those side effects and supplement with an inhalant. And you can also um, add yet another component and say, and I'll use local anesthetic on my surgical site to reduce the degree of surgical noxious stimulation and keep my, my other anesthetic uh, doses even lower. So you've got all of those options. And just as we talked about balanced analgesia, we can talk about balanced anesthesia and using several different drugs to achieve the desired effect. Um, and you know, you're, the only limits your imagination. You can use all of those combinations and approaches. Thank you very much, Paul. 
We are out of time. I'd like to thank the audience for their participation and thank you, Dr. Flecknell, for your informative presentation. And just so everybody knows, the, today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 2015. You'll receive an email from LabRoots telling you about this and feel free to pass that email on to your colleagues who may have missed today's live broadcast. Thank you again and see you next time.